which later was converted to the palace of the kings of Judah. But it was up the hill from this site that David was born, the result of Boaz and Ruth, Obed, and Jesse, his father, and he played in these fields. After he became king, these fields became very, very special. But now we come to the Christmas message. I have been at this site. There's the foundation of a second and third century church built over this. And behind the pulpit, this was under the apse. The apse is a word foreign to us in the Western culture. But historically, the apse was the place, much like a choir loft, it was a dome behind the pulpit as the central area of focus. And the central area of focus in this church was this manger. The door to that manger stall, the stable, by the way, is further down. That door has been found. That door had the symbol of priestly character and the Urim and Thummim. By the way, there's another palace of interest to us. Some four or five miles away, within sight of this, within open sight of this, was the Herodian palace. Now, Herod had a palace within Jerusalem, but he also elevated a hill called the Herodium and exercised all of his pomp and pageantry in building the great Herodium palace of Herod to retreat in security and safety in difficult times. Our retreat, of course, is the Son of God. That Herod is the one who despised the message that the Magi gave. We've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. But Herod considered himself worthy of worship. He didn't want anyone to be worshipped. He had essentially displaced much of the Sanhedrin, much of the ruling pharisaical bodies, much of the priestly caste, he had displaced the place where David ruled and built his own palace that to him was of greater consequence. He was, in essence, a megalomaniac. So he feigned response. And when the Magi said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. From his palace, Herod said, well... Let's find out what the scribes said. They brought the scribes. They said it's Bethlehem, not far away, just less than four miles from his palace. And he said, when you find him, bring word to me, and I will worship him as well. When they did not return, he, of course, slaughtered the innocents. But in God's providential care, he sent Joseph all the way down to Egypt, in isolation until the appropriate moment. So Herod's palace was not in synchrony or symphony with the birth of the Son of God. Why then, if we're talking about palaces, why did the King of Glory choose to be birthed in a lowly, stable, adjacent to an end that was full, near the foundation of the Tower of the Flock, Migdal Idar, why? We've examined the internal structure. There are actually three mangers built and hermetically sealed inside this area. One for the scapegoat to be analyzed. One for the high priest to offer along with the bullet for his own sins. And one for the sins of the nation of Israel and symbolically, the sins of the world. Now, it is appropriate that the Lord of glory, who was also of the seed of the woman, and his heel would be bruised, who would make his way to Calvary, it is appropriate that he would be born in the place where the Levites scrutinized, examined the lamb to be offered as the scapegoat, the ram, the lamb to be offered along with the bullock for the sins of the high priest. And then he could offer the lamb 
for the sins of Israel and the world. At the real Christmas time, Jesus Christ was probably born in this particular area. We're working very closely with the Israeli Department of Antiquities in examining and analyzing this. That brings us now to the conclusion. We've talked about palaces. We've talked about priests and kings and magi. We've talked about stars. But the ultimate message of Jesus is not the pageantry and the grandeur, is not the color and the excitement, it is Christ himself. The message of Christmas is that God absented himself from his throne, came to live with us in the fullness of time, gave himself for the sins of the world. But that's not the end of the message. He laid his head on a pulseless chest was placed in a cold, dark tomb. But then 72 hours later, he arose from the dead. And at this moment, he lives, knocking at your heart's door. Would you at this moment just pray this simple prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for recognizing my sinfulness and recognizing me in my plight. Thank you for leaving heaven to come to earth and be born and go to a cross and die for me and arise from the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you for caring. I want you in my heart right now. Right now, I open my heart to you. Lord Jesus, right now, come into my heart and live. I invite you to be my savior. And I will serve you with all my heart. If you prayed that prayer, then Christmas is an eternal dimension at your home. Creation in the 21st century has been sponsored by Trinity Broadcasting Network. And only with your love gift of support can this program stay on the air. So write to Creation in the 21st Century, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Creation in the 21st Century is a unique program on TBN combining biblical knowledge with scientific verification. Much of the information that I use on the program is available. Contact us. Just write Creation Evidence Museum, P.O. Box 309, Glen Rose, Texas, 76043, or call us at 254-897-3200. We look forward to hearing from you today.